Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, in this video, we're going to work through another time value of money problem. Uh, thanks to Alicia for uh, prompting me to work on this problem. Uh, so we're going to work through a retirement planning problem. Now, there's some artificiality here, and I find this is often the case uh, with uh, financial calculator retirement planning problems. I'm not too fussy on uh, sort of this very long-term estimate here, 32 years out. I just don't think that it's realistic that we're going to have this uh, definite a retirement goal. Uh, that being said, nice to have a goal to work towards because at least that way we can set some key performance indicators as we're working on our uh, retirement planning. So I would say that this is very approximate and 80% of your uh, income is a substantial amount of income to be expecting to replace in retirement. That's a pretty uh, lofty goal. And in fact, uh, I don't know if anybody listens to it. Uh, actually, I put a link in the show notes to it. But uh, Fred Vatisse was just on the uh, Rational Reminder podcast talking about this. And he said even the 70% and Fred, for those who don't know him, uh, he was the chief actuary at Morneau Chappelle, quite a well-respected retirement researcher. Um, and he had said that even the 70% that we hear often is probably too high based on the data that he's using. So we might say 50% uh, is a good starting point. He did qualify that just to uh, finish that off. He did qualify that and said, that we're looking at about 50% if you have no mortgage or if you're a homeowner is really what he said. And more than that, if you have to rent. Um, and I would say we're more likely to see um, folks going into retirement carrying a mortgage today. So maybe that uh, dispels some of this a little bit, but. That's okay. Now we're going to use some other sort of approximates here. It's very long term. So approximates are just fine. And we can look at uh, CPP. So Kate's working right now. She's 32 years from retirement. Uh, this year in 2020, the CPP max is about $13,000 a year. We'll go with that level. And the OAS max this year is about $7,000 a year. So we're going to use uh, those two figures for CPP and OAS. So there are two things that we can do. Uh, first off, right off the start, the question here asks how much of that in of that need is taken up by government benefits programs. So uh, first off, we see a seventy thousand dollar need, and I could. Uh, I can take 80% of that. That's what the question asks for, $56,000. Uh, now, what I could do here is I could inflate the retirement need and then inflate CPP and inflate OAS, but I really don't have to do that. I can just add them right here and then do my uh, inflation figures. So I can see in the simplest possible form. And I think this is the easiest way to do this. And it's gonna get the same result either way. If you wanna do the inflation check yourself, you're welcome to do it. Uh, but we see that she's gonna need about $36,000 a year of retirement income in her first year of retirement. Okay. And then we get into the question and we'll do this uh, on the next slide. We get into the question about what about the second year of retirement and so forth. And we'll deal with that uh, in a few minutes here. Okay, so that's $36,000. Now, what we really wanna concern ourselves with is what does that look like in that first year of retirement? You have to be really careful working through this with clients. Inflation is a difficult concept and we shouldn't take it for granted that the client necessarily understands inflation. I would suggest that if Kate is relatively uh, numerate, uh, that you're probably 
uh, okay talking to her about this, but if her numeracy is uh, low, if she still needs a little bit of training on that front, then maybe you're better off just to deal with the $36,000. And maybe after you've been working with her as a financial advisor for a few years, then it's time to sort of introduce the concept of inflation to say, hey, remember when we started this, here's what things cost. Look, we're five years into it. Now, Kate, let's talk about your retirement in a little more detail. So this is gonna be a straightforward time value of money exercise. We see uh, $36,000. That is our current uh, sort of shortfall. That would be her shortfall. If she retired today and needed 80% of her income, which is not realistic, I get that, and had full CPP and OAS, which again is not realistic, but it's a useful way to envision this problem. Um, so we can then do a little time value of money here. We're gonna apply 2% inflation. There's no payment here. You don't pay into inflation. There's no bill for inflation every year or whatever the case is, except maybe very conceptually. Uh, this is gonna be 32 years into the future. And then we're going to compute that future value. So. Again, pretty straightforward time value of money exercise here. And we'll give all our information. So I'm gonna do, I'm using the uh, BA2 plus, you'll see it on the bottom corner of the screen there. And we'll solve this on end mode. It doesn't actually matter with no payment. There's no relevance to begin or end, but we'll solve it on end mode. And then we at least have established something we know then. Uh, inflation is an in annual calculation, so we're going to do PY and CY at 1, uh, times PY is going to be 32, IY will be 2, present value is going to be negative 36,000. I actually could do as a positive, but we'll treat that as our, um, as our input, and then we're going to have our output later on at uh, retirement. Uh, payment is 0, and future value we're going to compute that amount. So now that we've got that down, we can pop over to our calculator and start by clearing the calculator. We'll clear our time value of money. I've got my calculator set to four decimal places. Uh, this calculation we just fine with two, but or even with zero really, but we'll do four. Uh, second function, PY, we're gonna set our PY and our CY both to one. So PY and CY are both one. We're 32 years out into the future. So N is 32. We are inflation of uh, 2% and 36,000 negative as our uh, present value, zero payment. It already would be set to zero because we cleared everything before we started, but that's okay. Uh, so that's about $67,844. And that's perfectly fine. Okay, so 67,844 is her approximate need in year one of retirement. And that would be in uh, real dollars. That's what she would actually be spending. That would be real dollars 32 years from now, 2052 or whatever the time frame is. So if we're looking to build a retirement account, this is why I like this calculation because it tells me really what the target is for, let's call it the payment in a uh, solution where we're trying to figure out the present value of Kate's needed retirement account. So that's, I think, a good start. We're going to uh, just jot down that 67,844. I'm gonna tuck it in at the very top uh, left corner here. So we know 32 years out at 2% inflation that her year one need is going to be 67,844. Honestly, if I were working with a client here, I would probably round that off to 68,000 just because there's no need to keep those last $166. Everything is very crystal ball here 
so I don't care that much about it, but that's okay. Uh, we'll use the 67844 just so we're um, consistent. And of course, we have assumed here that she's going to be age 65 uh, when she retires in 32 years. That's why there's CPP and OAS, and that assumes that those are still available in their same format 32 years from now. I'm not sure if I would take a bet on that, but uh, that's okay. We have to have some assumptions, and we have them. Okay, let's get rid of most of this then. And we've got more to this uh, Kate problem. And we're going to flip over to the second part of this, which is now if she can earn a 5% investment return uh, net of taxes. Okay, so really um, we can do whatever with taxes. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, in retirement, then how much principal does she need to be able to retire? This is really the sort of material question I would suggest. And, or at least the, the first part of the material question is roughly what is her retirement savings objective? That's really what we're setting out here. Okay. So we can, we're going to just bring back the calculator here. Okay. And clear our calculator. Okay. So this is really a two stage question. And we're going to have a sort of second part to the first stage. But thinking about this as a retirement planning problem, we're going to see a period of accumulation. And then we're going to see a period of decumulation. So now I'm going to put a little tilt on my lines here. So we have that accumulation period and that decumulation period. Okay. And what we know here is that the uh, accumulation period is going to be 32 years long. We know that the decumulation period is going to be one of 30. So throw that down here, 30 or 35 or 40 years. And this is sort of a stress test for our retirement. It's a very basic stress test. We're not doing all kinds of variables, but this is where we can see some what if scenarios for uh, Kate. So we say, if she's going to get that 5% return in retirement. And we're going to ignore any kind of considerations around whether this is a registered account or a non-registered account or whatever the case is. We know that we're trying to support a payment of $67,844 per year. Now, we could break that down to a monthly figure um, and that would be a little bit more uh, fidelity to the question, but I don't think that's necessary. We're 32 years out into the future, very approximate at this point. Like I said, this is really the crystal ball. Uh, we're not going to deal with any estate values here. The question doesn't give us any reason to do so. If there were some discussion around estate values, I would include them as the uh, future value. So actually, we can see just based on what we have here, that we now have a time value of money problem where we're going to solve for a present value. We'll come back and deal with the accumulation in a few minutes, but for now, we can solve this. So we know then that what we're trying to solve is really three different time value of money problems. We're going to say uh, 30 years, and then we're going to solve the same thing for uh, 35 years. And then we're going to solve the same thing for 40 years. This, by the way, would be uh, a good use of Excel or maybe even your financial planning software. If you can figure out how to do stress tests or even Monte Carlo simulations uh, in your uh, financial planning software. So PY and CY will leave it one uh, times PY is going to be uh, 30. IY is going to be five present value will be 
uh, what we're going to compute here. And payment is going to be the 67,844 that we've been using to this point, future value at zero. Now, the other thing to consider here is what's going to happen with inflation in retirement. So she might be able to get a 5% return, uh, but what if there's also 2% inflation? So she gets a 5% return and 2% inflation. And again, I'm gonna refer back to Fred Batiste uh, in the previously mentioned Rational Reminder podcast. And he, uh, of course, prods us here that we may not actually see inflation fully impact retirees, that there's some evidence here that retirees might only be partially impacted by inflation. And I think that there's some truth to that, that, um, really a lot of the things that retirees are likely to spend on are not going to be fully subject to inflation. And then some of the ways that folks live their lives doesn't even really match what we see here. It's actually probably unlikely that Kate would have 30 years of even spending in retirement. What's generally more likely is you'd have a higher level of spending for about the first third of your retirement a low level of spending as you kind of slow down. We sometimes call your uh, that first period the go-go years, the second period the slow-go years when spending will decelerate. And then the third uh, period there, the third third is going to be your no-go years. And that's when healthcare costs can be the bigger risk. So we sort of approximated again, Kate is so far from retirement that this is all very approximate at this point. Uh, so I'm not that concerned about it. If she were 55 or 60, then I might uh, put a little more uh, work into trying to sort of hammer out the exact spending pattern for each of those periods. Anyways, let's just use 2% inflation here. So this is where we're going to just use a real rate of return. Now we could do the dummy math way. We could do just five minus two and get uh, 3%. That's fine. Or we can do the longhand way is since it's a financial planning course and you'll have this formula on your formula sheet when you write any exam with FB Canada, you can do the longhand formula for rate of return, which is 0 0.05 uh, minus 0 0.02 divided by 1.02. Uh, and we can plug that into the calculator. And then we divide that by 1.02. And we should get 2.94%, and there it is, 2.94%. So we're going to use that rather than the 5%, and that's what we would call a real rate of return. And I would suggest, even if we're not happy with that full 2% inflation, uh, as I had suggested earlier, might not be accurate we should at least be applying some degree of inflation here. So even if you just want to apply half inflation or whatever the case is, there should be some inflation applied. So we're going to use 2.94% uh, as our rate of return. And now we can go through and solve this. Now, I'm going to prepare myself right now that I'm going to actually solve three different periods here. Uh, again, very easy to do this kind of thing with a financial calculator which allows me to adjust sort of one variable at a time quite easily. So we're only going to first off solve 30 years, then we're gonna just change the one field here, the times PY, and we're going to solve uh, then for 35 and then for 40 years. So uh, we will crack that calculator open again. We're gonna clear everything and we're gonna bring up our PY and CY menu. Everything is already set to one here. That's what we're working with. Uh, we have 30 years out into the future from her retirement date, a 2.94% interest rate. Uh, we're going to use 67,844. That amount is coming to her, so we'll treat that as a positive. That's going to be her annual income, and we'll compute the future value. So, what we're effectively saying here is that if she has uh, $1,340,145, and so I'll change that color, that's not very good. Um, if she has that, 
available on day one of retirement that she can support roughly $67,844 of inflation adjusted spending for 30 years. So if she started off spending that much and inflation was a perfect 2% every single year, then that would be the right dollar amount. Now, what we can do from there, is we say, well, what if, what if it was 35 years? So we all we have to do is change our, oh, sorry, let me fix that. All we have to do is change our, uh, times PY, that didn't take, I apologize, sorry, 35 second function times PY. We're gonna plug that into N and then we're going to recompute the present value. So just before I punch this in, I know that it's gonna be a larger value. It's five more years of mortality, five more years of income at that just shy of $70,000 level. So I know I should get a larger amount and there it is, a slightly larger amount for uh, $1,470,633. And I think you can see the benefit of this kind of thing. This little stress test we do for her retirement helps her to say, well, am I saving the right amount? How much risk do I want to take? Uh, can I save to sort of the lower goal right now and maybe make this up closer to retirement, which is, again, a very common retirement saving pattern. Uh, we're then going to just do our last bit here, 40 second function, and we can then compute our uh, present value. And again, no surprise, it went up by another roughly 120,000, I guess, dollars. And we're going to plug that in. We say perfect. We have an answer for the what if you live 40 years question. Okay, so we've now got uh, sort of these what if scenarios. We say the present value needed at retirement or the accumulation needed at retirement uh, will be uh, $1,340,145 uh, with 30 years of mortality or 30 years until mortality. Uh, we can play around with that a little bit more. We're not gonna do all the math here, but we know that we've got these other values here. And we'll at least record that we've done them. And that's 40 years then. So we are now really starting to work towards, I would suggest what looks like our retirement plan. And this is what your financial software is doing, your financial planning software is doing. This is what retirement needs calculators do. We're just doing it longhand and it's important. It's actually something that if you don't get the inputs that go into those retirement planning software, you won't see where they are or are not accounting for inflation. You won't see uh, where they are taking into account taxes or not taking into account taxes. And just as a quick example here, uh, if this were a registered plan, then I would have to adjust the amount of income. I'd have to use an after-tax amount of income to solve this problem. So it's really uh, quite variable as to how we use each number here, depending on uh, exactly what the uh, client circumstances are. All right, so we've got a good start here for, let's do that there. Got a good start for Kate. Uh, I think we can actually leave that there too. Okay, and now we can go on to the last slide that's sort of relevant to uh, Kate and her retirement problem. So now, what is probably her most important question today is how much do I have to save in order to accomplish this? So we're gonna just go with the 30 year figure. We're gonna boil it down to the 30 year figure. And we know then that her target 
is $1,340,145. Now, again, we would work with her and say, okay, that's sort of based on the assumptions we've made, that's your sort of minimum here. Uh, if you live longer, you might have to ramp up your savings a little bit. So thinking on our first line now, we're working on the accumulation line. We know that this is 32 years. We said earlier that she's 32 years from retirement. We're going to get a 7% investment return here. And we're trying to save to this uh, future value. Uh, there's no indication that she has any savings right now. So she's getting started, which is good for her. And on that basis, we're trying to solve for payment. Okay. Now you might be tempted to apply an inflation rate to that 7%. You might want to do a real rate of return here, but I would suggest that that's not accurate. The $1,340,000 is already adjusted for inflation. If that is her account balance on day one of retirement, if that's actually what the statement shows when she looks at it on day one of retirement, then she's okay, at least assuming that she lives for 30 years and gets a 5% return, then inflation is 2% and so forth. So this is her, starting point for retirement. So I don't want to adjust that 7%. I really want to say how much is Kate going to have to save at that 7% return. And you might think the 7% is too aggressive and that's fine. We can use a more conservative return. I'm not saying at all that 7% is the return that we should be using. I'm really just trying to solve a problem. Ditto for 5% retirement. By no means do I want to present 5% in retirement as the sort of optimal return. This is really a time value of money exercise first and foremost, and a financial planning exercise uh, really would follow this. We have a lot more work to do to get all the financial planning elements of this right. So we're going to do PY and CY at one. We're going to do 32 years. We're going to do 7%. Present value is zero. Payment is what we're trying to solve for. Uh, future value at $1,340,145. And we're gonna solve this on end mode. And actually I messed something up here. The question asks what she has to save each month. So we're gonna do 12 here for monthly savings. And we're gonna do one here. And that's average annual return. The question very specifically indicates an annual return. If you're using the HP calculator at this point, you're gonna to have to do the nominal and effective, which is a little bit of a headache on that calculator. All right, so now that we are here, we can think about, or we can pull up our calculator. We're gonna pull up our PY menu again for the first time. We can change that. We're gonna make our PY 12 and our CY 1. Remember that CY defaults when you change PY, so you do have to change your CY. So we are now on monthly payments, which is what the question asks, and annual compounding, which is what the question tells us we're doing. And then we're going to get out of that menu, and we know that we're 32 years down the road. So N is now 384. I guess that means Kate is going to put 384 deposits into whatever investment account she's using. Uh, we're going to give her a 7% rate of return, zero as our present value. Uh, she's trying to save towards that goal of $1,340,145. That's her future value. We can then compute her payment and we see about $982 is her required level of monthly savings. to get to uh, enough to sustain that retirement. Again, assuming that we did all of our retirement uh, calculations and assumptions properly, it's a big, big set of assumptions. 
And I would suggest that with a client who's still 32 years out from retirement, you're likely to play around with this quite a bit in that interim, uh, but it gives her something of a starting point, okay? So I hope that that's um, helpful. Hope it's useful to work through the Kate problem. I do want to just take a moment here longer, a few moments longer, I guess, to talk about the inputs and outputs into a problem like this based on the type of account that we're using. So let's have a look at this. And obviously we could solve the same thing for 1470633 and 1583521. Okay, get her a little bit of comfort with that. So now when we're thinking about saving for retirement, I've already talked about inflation here. So I said, really, if we inflate everything properly, here, that there's, then there's no need to inflate your uh, accumulation values. Now, what is a little bit unrealistic in a scenario like Kate's is that she probably doesn't need to save $982 a month right now. Her rate of savings should increase. So she should be uh, boosting her rate of savings, uh, let's say by uh, inflation every year or by a little bit plus inflation if we follow uh, Richard Thaler's nudge theory, then at least inflation in there. And I know a lot of Canadian mutual fund dealers allow that type of thing now. I'm a big, big fan of those types of things. So that's, uh, that's quite useful. So decumulation. If we've inflated everything properly, that's good. Now, if we're using non-registered accounts, So if you're using a non-registered account in your decumulation phase, what that means is your investment returns are taxed and that means you're going to have to use a real after-tax rate of return. You have to apply both uh, tax and inflation, okay? So let's say for the sake of argument that your effective tax rate on your investment returns is 20%. It shouldn't be your marginal tax rate. You should be getting a little more tax efficiency uh, even a GIC investor can use index link GICs to build in some tax efficiency here. So we're going to use a tax rate of just 20%. It might even be lower than that if you're uh, able to retire sort of into the bottom tax bracket in most provinces, you're probably going to have an effective tax rate closer to 10%, but we'll use 20% here. So you can apply both uh, tax and inflation then. So if you have um, inflation of 2% and a return as we had before of 5%, uh, the first thing you wanna do is take off taxes. So taxes come before inflation, taxes are more sort of immediate. It's gonna do five minus 20%, easy bit of math here, that's uh, 4%. And then that's what you're gonna plug into your inflation calculator, you're going to do 0.04 minus 0.02 divided by 1.02. Again, using that longhand formula for real rate of return. And then we can bring up our uh, calculator. So 0.04 minus 0.02. Uh, divided by 1.02. And that gives us a 1.96% uh, rate of return. That's what you would be using, assuming that we've got inflation calculated properly or that we have used the right assumption for inflation. Um, and that's it. I'm hoping that I don't have to use the word assume so much in future videos, but it is honestly the nature of these long-term problems. Now, on the other side here, if I'm using non-reg accounts for my accumulation, once again, my investment returns are taxed. I'm going to apply only tax to my investment returns. So we're probably at a slightly higher tax rate here uh, if you're 
doing things this way, you might be looking at say a 7% return if we're gonna do what we did before, maybe a 30% effective tax rate. Although you can do a lot of equity investing here, presumably you can take advantage of capital gains and dividends. So my 30% might be a little high, but whatever, that's okay. So then we just take seven minus 30%, just like so. We can plug that into our calculator, seven minus 30%. And that's gonna give me 4.9%. Uh, that's the rate of return that I would be using then to uh, get Kate from here to day one of retirement, once we've taken into account that non-reg savings. Now, on the other hand, if we are using an RRSP, so let's flip this around now, and we'll use RSP and RIF. Okay, and I know if you're just working through sort of sequentially, you haven't done chapter uh, 13 yet, but I think everybody is going to be at least broadly aware that when you put money into an RSP, you get a tax deduction, and then when you take it out, it's taxable. So in this case, uh, I would not apply tax to the investment returns. Okay. Instead, your withdrawals are taxable. Okay. And because the withdrawals are taxable, this is where you have to do things a little bit more onerously. What you would do here, assuming that we're dealing with uh, that same uh, 67,844 of income, and let's say a 30% marginal tax rate, and this is where I might have to be a little bit more precise. I might have to calculate an effective tax rate on your RIF withdrawals. Uh, that's a fairly complex thing to do. It is possible in Excel, but it's not something we're gonna do easily right here. So we'll just use 30%. It's good enough just to illustrate the concept. And this is where we would take 67,844 uh, uh, divided by uh, one minus that 30% tax rate. That's really what we call a tax gross up. We're grossing that amount up to get us to taxes. So one minus 30% is 70%. So we're just gonna do 67, uh, 844. We can do it all longhand. We can do uh, divided by, and then open a bracket here and do uh, one minus, I think this works. I honestly don't remember on this calculator if this is gonna work or not, but uh, looks like it. And we get $96,920. So that's basically, we're saying if she's using registered money, then she doesn't need 67,844 on day one of retirement, she needs $96,920. Or we'll say year one of retirement. Okay. This is actually much more difficult uh, on the accumulation side now. So now if we're using RSP to save, well, you're just gonna use the full 7%. Okay, uh, there's no tax on your investment returns. And you also have to figure out some way to account for saving your pre-tax dollars. So. I would suggest that there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument, she's at a 40% tax rate. Well, really what we could argue here, and there's a bunch of it depends around this, but we could argue is that then if she's saving something like Uh, whatever we had $983, if I remember right, per month in a non-reg account where it's not deductible, okay, that's gonna be about the same as again, doing this gross up type of calculation where we can take uh, the 983, again, divided by one minus that tax rate. 
So 983 divided by 60%, or we can do the math again, all the long way on the calculator, 983 uh, divided by open bracket, uh, one minus 40%, close bracket, equals $1,638. So we can argue that um, spending power, or when we take taxes into account, that saving $1,638 a month in a registered account in an RSP is going to be the same. And again, you have to make some assumptions about how she treats her tax savings and so forth. But I would suggest that if she's perfectly rational with her dollars, which may or may not be the case, that that is the right way to uh, address this problem. And then finally, of course, we have the TFSA. And then uh, retiring with the TFSA. And this may not be realistic. Uh, notably, she would blow her TFSA room out of the water uh, about uh, seven months into retirement, I believe, or seven months into each saving year. But anyways, if we're using the TFSA to save, you would use the full 7%, but you would use the pre, sorry, the after-tax amount. So you would use the $983. And then if you retire with the TFSA, you get your uh, full investment return. There's no tax. And you get your full withdrawal. Again, no tax. So it's a matter of each of those has their sort of uh, downside between RSP and TFSA. The RSP, you get the tax deduction at the front, but tax at the end. The TFSA, no tax deduction at the front, but then no tax at the end. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, this is, I know, a little bit ahead of where we are in uh, chapter five, if that's where you are with the course. But when we get into chapters 13 and 14 and beyond, this kind of problem is very typical. This is also a very typical uh, setup for an exam question from FP Canada. So I hope that helps. And again, I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much.